My respected Thai dear brothers and sisters and dear friends, today is December 31st in the year 2019, and we are in the Ocean of Peace Meditation Hall. Uh, within a few hours, we'll be welcoming the new year, 2020. A couple of uh, weeks ago, the organizing team for this holiday retreat had asked me if I can help give a Dharma talk. And I had no idea uh, what the topic was, what the title was, and I just said, sure. And then they said, Sister Kinyam, you're going to be giving the talk about healing ourselves. I was like, oh, that's a big topic. <laughs> healing ourselves. And you're like, I still have a long way of healing myself. So let alone, how am I going to help us heal ourselves? There's so many selves in this uh, healing process. And it took me uh, quite a while to digest that idea that I'm going to have to heal myself before I have to heal, I can help anybody heal themselves. And uh, I was thinking, there's so much to say. There's so many things to do. I mean, what do you want me to heal for my own practice? What do I want to heal? And I thought, you know, there's, there's the healing of my body, there's the healing of my emotions and my feelings. And there's also the spiritual healing of my practice. There's a lot of healing that can happen with myself because I can hold all of that inside of me. And I said, okay, I really have to pinpoint it down. And one of my brothers said, Sister Ginyam is probably going to use the sword and just to cut through everything very easily. I said, I haven't sharpened my sword in the longest time. <laughs> it's very dull. And so one of the things that I said, okay, I'm going to take this one step at a time and look deeply within myself to offer my practice um, for you. Tai has oftentimes spoken about or taught us about the second arrow, the teachings of the second arrow. The first arrow, when it comes to us, it creates the wound, the initial wound to our body. And the second arrow comes in. And it doesn't double the pain that we have in our body twice. It actually amplifies that pain to tenfold a hundred times more. And that second arrow is our ideas, our fear, our anger, our frustration. And so it's been a practice, that I said, to take away that second arrow and to look simply at that first arrow, the physical pain that we have in our body. The other day, I... Uh, was cooking, I was cooking for arrival day, and I haven't cooked for a while. And I was lucky to be able to cook for the community. And so the next morning I woke up and my shoulders were in pain. I said, oh, I can't go to sitting meditation today because I can't wake up. My arm is in fact from all that stir frying and all the moving around. I, it, I'm not complaining. <laughs> but I then, I said, okay, but I have to do sitting meditation because I'm going to lead the sitting meditation. <laughs> and uh, I was holding the bell inviter. I was like, oh, this is so heavy. This, the bell inviter was so heavy. I was like, I really have to lift this up and invite the bell and keep my posture composure. And through, I realized throughout my whole practice, because the guided meditation itself was aware of the body, relaxing the body, calming the body, releasing the tensions in the body. And by the end of my meditation, 
my, the pain I felt in my arm, the sore muscles, was gone. I would, and didn't notice it as much. And because I didn't have my mind say, oh my God, I'm in pain. What did I do? Like the second arrow that comes in and just sort of like amplifies this pain. But being able to come back to my breathing and recognizing that physical pain in my arm as it is, simply breathing and allowing it to let go and to relax. Because what I've noticed is that every time that my mind starts to be dramatic, so dramatic, the body holds on to it even more. It holds on to it even more. Then I have an excuse not to go to sitting meditation this evening because I still have my shoulder pain. But being able to recognize the physical pain as it is and to follow my breathing and to apply the practice That's why when I said in the introduction is to experience the practice in your own body, not intellectually, but experience in your own body. Because your body has the capacity to let go. It is our mind that likes to hold on to things in our own body. I've had this uh, mini insight uh, a couple of months back, or a couple of years ago, but it hasn't ripened, but that our body does hold a lot of its memory. And uh, there is a popular book that I'm sure some of us have probably read called The Body Keeps the Score about uh, trauma. And it is true. The experience of ho- that shoulder pain or muscle pain that I have in my body, I can reimagine it again any time that I want to, and I can feel it there already. It's no longer there. No longer there. But I can still have that memory of that. The body holds it. This morning, I was playing with a very sweet young boy, Chugi. And uh, I was holding his hand. And I said, oh, your hands are so cold, Shuki. And he just smiled. But I, and I can feel the coldness of his hands against the warmth of my hands. And even at this moment, I can feel his hands still here, placed in the palm of my hand even though physically it is not there. I am a mischievous sister, and so sometimes I like to tease my elder sister. And uh, she's uh, a bit sensitive. She gets easily tickled. (laughs) And I don't have to do anything. I don't have to, 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 to physically touch her. So I would just sit next to her, and just hover my hands <laughs> over her knees. I just hover my hands over her knees. And she would look at my hands and she would slap it away. She said, that tickles. I said, but I didn't touch you. <laughs> so then there are things that our body remembers, that our body remembers, not by, by the history of what we have experienced, And that can be a pleasant feeling or an unpleasant feeling. And our senses, our contacts, our eyes and ears and nose and body are the food that comes into triggering these memories that we have stored in every cell of our body. This evening, I was just walking down after dinner to Clarity Hamlet, and I just sort of cleared my throat. And it's completely dark. I didn't bring my flashlight, and it's completely dark. And uh, I saw a sister. I can tell it was a sister because no brother would walk down to Clarity at this time. 
and she was holding a flashlight and I saw the hem of her robes. And I asked, who is that? And she said, it's me, Shiko. And she said, I thought, and I said, hello, okay, we can walk down together. And she said, I thought it was you, Shiko, because I heard you cough. And I said, that sounded like Sister Ginyu. And so even through sounds, we are triggered. We, our memory is brought up through sounds, what something we, that we hear, our body reacts to. Contact, our body reacts to. So something that we see, our body reacts to before the actual feeling and the emotion goes with it. So our body holds a lot of the physical contact and whether pleasant or unpleasant feelings. And how do I heal that? How do I heal that? Because it's very strong. You know, taking care of our physical health is one thing. Exercising, working out, eating healthy, cutting out on sugar, all of that is is just one aspect of healing our body, taking care of our body. How can the practice help us let go of the tension, of the pain, of the feelings that it has stored in our body? And the practice of deep relaxation has helped us not just to help us fall asleep. As I've heard, some of us fell asleep very easily, very deeply during meditation. It's not just that. Try deep relaxation, fully awake. Being completely aware of all of the muscles in your body and going down using sort of like your, the ray of the laser of mindfulness that you have generated to do an MRI of your body, cutting it down to the finest hairline of each muscle in each cell, and to ask your body, how are you today? How are you feeling today? And if there is any part of your body that you feel this bit tight, you can breathe and say, it's okay. Let's breathe together and we relax that muscle together. Slowly you will be able to transform and to heal the physical body, the physical tension, and let go on the deeper level of the pain that you have held inside or recorded inside. I am assuming that a lot of... Uh, us in this room have children, and um, if you haven't yet watched Frozen 2, I'm sure your kids have been bugging you to watch Frozen 2. I have nieces and nephews of my own, and there's a line in the movie Frozen 2, I know. And the line says, water stores memory. Water stores memory. I don't want to have any spoiler alerts for <laughs> the kids who didn't watch it yet. But water stores memory. And yesterday, Sister D shared that, you know, our body is made of two-thirds water. So even that element in our body can store the pain and suffering and stories it has not told or stories it has experienced. Hmm. So water stores memory. There's a lot of things that happen in our everyday life as a child whether pleasant or unpleasant, and growing up as an adult. And there are simple things that we do now that is harmless for us. I would like to use an example of a hug. Like Olaf, 
he loves warm hugs. But he doesn't understand that if he gets warm hugs, he'll melt into water. But a hug is harmless. It's just an act of embracing somebody in your own two arms. For some, it is comforting, it is consoling, it is an act of love and compassion. It brings about a feeling of safety and security. But for others, it doesn't. For others, a hug can bring about discomfort, can bring about fear, bring up the feelings of violence, insecurity, at the same time, the feeling of invasion of space. Now we can't say that it's the hug's fault for those feelings. We cannot blame the hug. Can we? Can we blame the hugger or the giver? Or can we blame ourselves? We should not blame ourselves. But it's an opportunity at that moment to look again inside ourselves of where the feeling of insecurity is coming from, where the feeling of invasion of space is coming from, or where the feeling of comfort is coming from. Some of our fondest memories could be from our mother and father cradling us to sleep. But at the same time, some of our fondest memories are not from our mother and father. The feeling of being embraced sometimes did not associate with happiness. So it's a chance for us to look deeply inside of ourselves. It is a practice to receive a hug, an invitation to receive a hug. At the same time, it is a practice to offer a hug for ourselves and for others. And sometimes we can start small. We don't need to hug everyone in this room. Have you ever tried hugging yourself? We have a brother He's not here at Deer Park. He loves to offer a practice of hugging meditation to yourself. All you need to do is just hug your arms and your shoulders and breathe in and out deeply three times and say, I know you are there and I am so happy. I know I am here and I am so happy. The practice of hugging meditation for yourself. And that can be the first step of healing for your own body, for your own body. Healing your own body through hugging meditation in your own body. There is a sister here who loves hugs. She is the living Olaf in Clarity Hamlet. A sister with a great big smile I'm not smiling, so it's not me. Um, she loves hugs, and she offers that as a comfort and consoling out of love and compassion. But sometimes I like to ask myself, why am I hugging a person? Why am I hugging a person? Is it because I also need to feel the comfort of an embrace? Am I hugging out of compassion to a friend, a child of love? Yay! 
I think she's singing happy birthday to her brother. Um, so a hug. When I come back and I look at myself and offering a hug to another person, where am I standing? Why and how am I hugging that person? Why and how? Am I coming because I want to be superior to that? I'm going to be the one to comfort you. Or am I needing this hug also? So it's a practice of giving and receiving a hug. When you are able to feel safe inside yourself, secure inside yourself, you can offer that space also. So when I would like to hug someone, I do not ask, can I have a hug? I ask, may I hug you? And if the, anybody says no, you may not, then I won't hug them, especially the kids. And the kids sometimes are a bit scared of uh, brothers and sisters with no hair. And uh, they look at us with fear. And I ask, can I have a hug? And they say, no. And then I said, okay, it's okay. How about a high five? And they're comfortable with high fives. They have high fives. And it's the respect that I have for that person, whether it is a four-year-old child or a fully grown adult. It's because the space and where they feel safe and comfortable. So it is a practice. And tonight we have a practice of, we can practice hugging meditation as a part of welcoming the new year. Um, and Thay has offered that when we join our palms and we bow to the person we are about to hug and we open our arms and we embrace them. We don't need to pat them on the shoulders or we said, oh, I love you, or whatever it is. It's just to hold them. And just the feeling, recognizing the feeling of your arms embracing another person's body. And breathing in, I know you are there. Breathing out. I'm so happy for three breaths. And recognizing your whole body at that time standing on the floor and the position of your arms around that person and both breathing together in unison without having to say one word. And then joining your palms and looking at each other in the eyes and bowing the practice of hugging meditation. During the Buddha's time, uh, there were four types of suffering that inspired the Buddha to, well, inspired Prince Siddhartha to seek a path to end suffering. And the suffering that he experienced or he saw was birth, death, ill-being, and old age, aging, the, the four, four types of suffering. And I realized that our suffering has evolved from four to many. And that also in that many includes money, a lack of money, a lack of fame, lack of power, uh, no Wi-Fi, and 2% battery life. Ask any teenager, it is their greatest suffering when their phone hits 2%. Oh, and when their AirPods run out of batteries also. So suffering has evolved. 
when the time of the Buddha is just sitting and breathing and looking deeply into the seven factors of awakening and contemplating the body and the body, and then they reach enlightenment. And for us, trying to figure out ways to keep our battery life long. Finding that spot in the mountains at Deer Park where there is good reception. I see you guys. Um, and so that means since suffering has evolved, the way of embracing our suffering needs to evolve also. So we cannot use the same old school things for new school things, can we? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And this is where creativity comes in to our practice. Tai has often says that uh, we have a book of suffering. Each and every one of us has our own book. And each and every one is writing their own chapters in this, in this book. It is not simply just to write down all of the suffering and the pain that you have. It is the art of suffering. Because suffering is an art. It takes great skill. So we should update our book every now and then. Take a moment to look back at what we are suffering at this moment. I know baby boomers suffer differently from, I think we are in Generation Z right now. I don't know what generations I fall into, but I think it's somewhere between millennial and generation. I don't know why a millennial. Um, and so there's a lot of different types of suffering for the different times. And no suffering invalidates another. No suffering invalidates another. Just because my book may be not the same as your book, it doesn't mean my suffering is different or invalid. Invalid. We have a tendency to think or we are taught to believe that we should end suffering. Our main purpose of practicing is to end all suffering and to achieve the highest goal and the highest liberation. I don't know where you guys got that idea from. I didn't say it, and definitely the Buddha did not say it either. But somehow we believe that in order to attain great happiness, Suffering no longer needs to be there. There needs to be the end of suffering. The end of suffering. Because with suffering, the suffering is the cause of our unhappiness. We believe so. And Tai oftentimes says that no mud, no lotus is very poetic, very beautiful, but I still need to end the mud. I still need to end the suffering to attain happiness for myself. And life would be better without suffering. Life would be better without suffering. But did you know that in the Buddha's house, in the Buddha's house, and this is what we call the Tathagata's house, in the monastery, or in your own house as a practitioner, is called the Buddha's house. That suffering has the highest seat of honor. It's the highest seat of honor. In fact, Mara is the Buddha's best friend. Not because Mara makes the Buddha look good. You know, Mara is the mischievous one, the wrongdoing, and the Buddha is the holy one. And just standing next to Mara, the Buddha looks good. So he doesn't have to practice. He just looks good because he's standing next to Mara. It's not because of that. They are best friends. It's because they can understand one another. The Buddha can understand Mara, and the Mara... And Mara can understand the Buddha. So that's why they are best friends. That's why they are best friends. So there's no need. 
to have to end suffering. And the Buddha has taught us about looking with non-discriminative, non-dualistic eyes. And we still see certain things with dualistic eyes. We know that this is because that is, this is not because that is not. We understand that this flower needs the sun, the water, the earth in order to manifest. And if you take something away, it will not manifest. But when we think about suffering, we say, I don't need suffering. I just need happiness. But suffering is because happiness is. Happiness is not possible because suffering is not understood. So suffering is the source of your own happiness. So there's no need to find a solution to solve a problem. Even if that solution is walking, sitting, eating, or drinking tea meditation. They're just accumulation of ideas of what happiness is in comparison to suffering. So in order to embrace suffering, you do not need, uh, in order to have happiness, you do not need to push away suffering. You do not need to do sitting meditation every day at Deer Park Monastery, to breathe in Deer Park Monastery's air, to fill up on energy, and then to face all the suffering of the world. You don't need any of that. You just need to understand. Breaking through the ideas of suffering, a dualistic view of suffering and happiness. I was once told, <laughs> I find this amusing, but I was once told by a person that they believed that they are the source of my suffering. And I just looked at that person and I was like, really? Really? Can somebody actually be the source of one's suffering or is that suffering inside myself? It's the same of feeling the suffering of the physical body and then just having my hand hover over your knees and you get ticklish. But the hand is not the source of the ticklish. It's the memory or the suffering that I already have in my consciousness. So when I heard that, I, was, I didn't know what to make of it. Should I burst that person's bubble and say, no, you are not? Should I laugh or should I cry? I didn't say anything, but I thought to myself. In Thai's words, suffering is a choice. It's a choice that we make. We can choose to suffer, or we can choose to understand and be happy. And in the words of Ash, I believe it's Ash in Pokemon, if, when he gets ready to battle with all the Pokemon, I, I think I understand his theory, and he throws this little capsule, red and white capsule, and he says, Pikachu, I choose you. I think it is. <laughs> so then, suffering is a choice, and I don't choose you. I don't choose you that no one person can be the source of your suffering. Suffering is my own choice. It is your own choice to suffer. And so I just smiled and continue on. The other day I was uh, sharing with one of the sisters and I said, you know, we are all, we all have AI. We all are AI, and she just looked at me like, you mean we're robots and we're all artificial intelligence? I said, no, 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 not artificial intelligence. We have adaptive intelligence. 
We have learned to adapt to our certain situation, whether now we're sort of learning to adapt to climate change, we're sort of getting used to this extreme hot and extreme cold weather. We have learned how to adapt to certain situations of discomfort. In psychotherapy, they call it coping skills. So we, we have this intelligence to be able to adapt to certain situations. And that's what we are. We are AI. We have this adaptive mechanism. And this comes from the very beginning of time. Since maybe if what Tai says caused the original fear. The moment you are birthed through your mom from the womb, whether it's a natural birth or to C-section, the first thing that you have to do on your own for your own survival is to take an in-breath and to breathe on your own in order to survive. No one taught you to breathe in, I'm aware of my in-breath, breathe out, I'm aware of my... No one taught you that. And if you did not breathe, the nurse will start slapping your bottom and to make sure you scream and in order to breathe, and you have the first grasp of air, that is your body learning how to survive. You're natural adapting to the new environment that you're in, and we're very quick. We are very quick in adapting to the new environment. And sometimes, even in our practice, we become very quick to adapt to the needs of our suffering. The practices of walking meditation is wonderful. And we have a training that if you get angry, all you need to do is to practice walking meditation and breathe and look deeply at your anger and then the anger disappears. Then your mind starts to register, oh, that works. And then so every time you go into getting strong emotions, you're just going to do walking meditation because that's the way that we have adapted ourselves to survive. This idea of this is what happiness feels like. And so it's very dangerous if we are just putting ourselves in this autopiloting mode. The brother says, and the sister says, if I'm feeling tired, I'm just going to sit and breathe and relax my whole body. And that's the healing of my body, or healing of my feelings or my emotions. And that it comes to just there. And it stops right there. So the practice itself can be the obstacle of deeper transformation. It becomes a coping skill more than a means of healing. There was one time, uh, a couple of years ago, a sister, a very sweet sister, and she said she was welcoming some of our guests arriving that day. Friday and staying for the week. And she says, I hope your stay here will be meaningless. <laughs> she mistaken the word for meaningful because she was studying English and she was remembering the five contemplations of meaningless thinking and conversations. She used the wrong word. And it's supposed to be meaningful time at Deer Park Monastery, but she blurted out meaning, meaningless. And she didn't get that we were all giggling and laughing, and she was just straight faced, I'm serious, meaningless. You know, and then we're like, you mean meaningful? And then she became very shy. But I have to say, if you are coming here, if you come here, if you have come here to Deer Park, as a way to suffer less, you have come to the wrong place. 
I will get in trouble for this. You have come to the wrong place if you are looking to suffer less. My sister, I have a younger sister, and before she became a nun, she was in Pan Village, and she says, she wrote to Thai, and Thai was just like, I don't know, amused or amused by it. And he said, sister, can you? Your younger sister says she wants to be in a place that is happy in the morning, happy in the afternoon, and happy in the evening, happy 24 hours a day. And I told her, you won't find that here. You won't find that happiness here if you're looking for it for 24 hours a day. Because it's so easy to get stuck in the idea of what happiness is. Happiness is not Deer Park. It's not Deer Park Monastery. Suffering less is not at Deer Park. Because you choose not to suffer at Deer Park. People can come here and they can suffer. So Deer Park is not a place to suffer less. Deer Park is to help you understand and to practice in a community to embrace our suffering and our pain together and to transform and heal together. So to identify happiness as Deer Park is a wrong perception. I hope I don't get in trouble tonight. Mm. The practice, again, the practice can be accumulated, can give you a lot of accumulation of ideas of what happiness is. You might have some deep suffering inside of you, and just breathing together with the sisters, just walking together with the brothers, or eating a meal that is cooked by the brothers and sisters can give you a sense of happiness. For one, you didn't have to cook it. You just come and practice and come and eat. It's already there. There's already a greatest happiness. You know, when you come home from work and you have to cook and then you have to clean and get the kids to do homework and all that kind of stuff, you can't really enjoy your meal at peace. And here the kids can do whatever. The meal's already done. But that is a simple happiness. A simple happiness. But it can also fall into the trap of that is it. That's what it is to happiness. Happiness is in the meal. Happiness is just being able to do all these simple things. You are then just grasping another idea, letting go of the idea of suffering to holding on to an idea of happiness. And so therefore, when does the healing and the transformation happen? When you let go all of your ideas of suffering and of happiness. You're coming back to yourself and being honest with yourself. Being completely honest with yourself and embracing yourself and offering yourself a hug. Sometimes we allow ourselves to get comfortable in the practice. Oh, this is easy. All I have to do is just sitting meditation every morning and just walk quietly. I can do this, you know, and you get yourself comfortable. Once you know you're in the comfort zone, you don't want to do anything else. It beca- you become sloth by nature. Just taking it easy, taking it slow. And so it's very dangerous as a practitioner to fall into the comfort of practice. Because then you don't take yourself seriously anymore. You're no longer in survival mode. 
no longer needing to take care and to breathe deeply because you have everything under control. And it's comfort. I know what to do. I know what to do. And so if you're looking for comfort, you won't find it here. The Sangha is the best place to shake things up. <laughs> I'll get in, I would get in trouble. It's the best place to shake things up. And you're living with so many different people, so many different ideas, so, so many different cultures and backgrounds and upbringings that you're really rubbing elbows with one another and becomes a perfect mirror to look at yourself. But if you find yourself living in the Sangha or practicing with the Sangha and being comfortable where you are, maybe you are not progressing on the path of healing and transformation. I have 10 minutes. I'd like to tell a story. Um, maybe two. I believe that I was... Um, I must have been very difficult to raise in the monastery. <laughs> uh, I, for those who don't know, I grew up in the monastery. Um, I ordained when I was very young, uh, at 14. And so the brothers and sisters, and especially Thai, had to put up with my teenage years. And I remember one time um, at Green Mountain Dharma Center, in Vermont. We had uh, a center in Vermont, Maple Forest Monastery and Green Mountain Dharma Center. It's a small community, later we moved to Blue Cliff, New York. Uh, and we lived in a house. The center was a home, a big plot of land in a three-story home. And it was basically a public space. We didn't have much of a private space. So when the brothers came over for the day of mindfulness, the sister's study room uh, was used as a common room. So when the brothers would come in to put their bags in, you know, we didn't have our own private space. It was an open door. And we would still have our bookshelves there. And they would just come in and sit and drink tea or just wait and put their bags in the common room because there was not much space around. And I remember that one day, uh, one of the brothers decided he wanted to drink tea. And I was 16 at that time. I was 16 at that time. And so on my shelf, I had a teapot uh, my can of tea and my thermos. And the brother wanted to have some tea. So he took that. He took the, my tea set and he was preparing tea. And I asked him, the brother, what are you doing? And he, he said, I'm having tea. I said, no, you're not having tea. And I took my tea set and I put it back. <laughs> He's my elder brother, not my younger brother. He's my elder brother. So it's traditionally is unheard of, disrespecting the elders. But I was a full-blown American teenager at that time, so it didn't really bother me. <laughs> and so what happened next, and after walking meditation, because there was snow and it was cold, and he wanted to have some tea, so he wanted to help himself again. And I come in and said, what are you doing, brother? And he said, I would like to have some tea. I said, no. <laughs> and then I put my tea set back again. And then after lunch, he wanted to have tea again. And I said, no. And he went back and he said, I am drinking tea because I am building brotherhood and sisterhood. And that just triggered me. And I said, no, you are not drinking tea. And he just like, but drinking tea is building brotherhood and sisterhood. And I just shook my head, no. 
Why? How can you call it building brotherhood and sisterhood when you are drinking tea? You are happy, and I am unhappy. There's no building brotherhood and sisterhood here. In, in the end, he didn't drink the tea. And of course, I wasn't happy that I couldn't operate. I'm usually quite okay, you know, drinking tea. But it would have been nice if. I was asked or informed first. And so sometimes we get this idea that building or drinking tea is building brotherhood and sisterhood because that's what Thay said. It's a chance for us to sit and drink. It is a means for us to come together. But the act of tea drinking is not brotherhood and sisterhood. It's the difference. Just because you're drinking tea doesn't mean you're building something. If you are happy and I'm unhappy, yes, it's a different story. It's a means to bring us together. So walking meditation, sitting meditation, is a means to bring to water the seas of happiness and joy. It is not happiness and joy. It is a means to bring yourself healing and transformation. It is not healing and transformation. It is the finger pointing to the moon. It is not the moon itself. So the practice of learning all, all the practice that we have learned in the past three or four days is wonderful. There's nothing wrong. But when we get caught in these ideas of what the practice is and what the practice isn't, that's when we trap ourselves in our own ideas and we become an obstacle for our own transformation and healing. I have four minutes, so I don't think I can tell the story in four minutes. Um, so yes. The practice is to be able to free ourselves, to allow ourselves space to heal and to transform, not to accumulate more ideas of how to do it. Let go of those ideas and allow it to happen. And whenever strong emotions arise, or physical pain arises, you are ready to embrace and to smile at it and to breathe with it. There's no need to push it away. There's no need to shut the book. There's no need to feel ashamed or to blame yourself or to blame others because we have learned the art of suffering, to smile and to embrace it. Suffering is because happiness is. Happiness is because suffering is. And we should allow suffering to be. And with the energy of mindfulness, we can be aware of what feeds that suffering what triggers that suffering, whether it's our physical body, our emotion, or even our spiritual suffering. So I would like to thank all of you for being here and uh, allowing me to uh, share my practice uh, with all of you. Yes. Yeah. And uh, don't get too comfortable. Don't get too comfortable. It's, I'm always up for an adventure, up for a challenge. It keeps me on my toes. And it allows the transformation and healing to be continuous. You may heal one layer, and then you come back again to heal a second layer a third layer. Thank you.